Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to our talk today on um, building apps for the Chrome OS ecosystem. My name is Sweet, and I'm a product manager for Android apps on Chrome OS. For today's session, we're going to cover three different topics. The first is an update on our Chrome OS ecosystem growth. The second, we're going to be introducing the cool new features that we've been working on. And lastly, developer notes and best practices to enhance your experience on Chrome OS. So starting off with our ecosystem update for our Chrome OS growth, Chrome OS devices run Android apps through the Play Store using an Android container. But we are inherently different from a lot of the traditional Android phones in that we have a larger screen. We also have different inputs, including keyboard, mouse, stylus. Users also use more multi-monitor support with us. And they tend to use a lot more of multitasking with multiple windows and activities going on at the same time. So as a leading OS for Google's large screen experiences, we've been really doubling down to provide the hardware that's capable of doing all these wonderful things. In addition to the clamshells, the convertibles, and the Chrome boxes, this past year, we've launched our very first tablets and detachables. But as we have more of a device hardware corpus, we've also seen more users as well. In Q4 of 2018, 21% of all notebooks sold in the US were Chromebooks. That's a 23% year-over-year growth over our last year. We're currently in nine countries and physically in more than 10,000 stores. And we're continuing that expansion this year as well. So we have our device portfolio. We have more users. But also, users are responding more to apps in Google Chrome OS. In the last year, app usage on Android on Chrome OS has grown by 4x. And that's a testament to our growing app catalog, along with users finding more utility and better experiences on their Chrome OS devices from the apps. There's two that I really want to highlight. The first one is Asphalt 8, a racing car game. We work with them to really enhance the experience on our Chrome OS devices, specifically around keyboard support and tablet mode. And we found that after these improvements, they've seen a 6x boost in daily activity and a 9x boost in app revenue. We've been really proud of these numbers. And we've been working with them on Asphalt 9 which is in our retail mode in physical stores as well to show off. The other app is Concepts, which we just saw in our video just now. Concepts is an illustrating app. And it's really well positioned with Chrome OS because we have a really fast and responsive stylus, along with a larger screen real estate on our devices so users can ideate more. Compared to the other devices, we've seen that on Chrome OS, They've had 12x more time spent and double the paid conversions. And on our higher end devices for the Pixel Books and Pixel Slates, it's even better with 20x more time spent and quadruple the paid conversions. And those are just two examples of apps that we've been working with with our developers. And they've seen users embrace them. And we're happy to work with you as well uh, to sh promote and really make your apps shine on Chrome OS. Uh, as an added bonus, your apps uh, improved for Chrome OS are also going to benefit from those on Android foldable phones and Android tablets. So you get more bang for your buck, too. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Stefan Kune, one of our Angelis, on what we've been working on this past year. Hello, everyone. I'm Stefan Kuhne. I'm one of the tech leads bringing Android to Chrome OS. And you have maybe seen me earlier in earlier talks. And this brings me already to what I'm talking about today. Well, all the changes we have done over the past year to this year. So let's have a look. First off, we were launching Android Pie. Well, it's a little bit snow of yesterday, I know. But the thing is, like, we were actually starting that conversion process end of last year with our Pixel Slate tablet. And we are continuing to rolling out Pi to all our fleet. 
And at the same time, we are also improving the quality, stability, performance, and all the other kind of things over the course of this year. At the same time, we were also turning on Android P by default on for most users. So means for end users. OK. So another thing what we have done is we were doubling down on uh, improving the developer quality. So first off, there is a one-click installer for Android Studio. Much less hassle than before. You will definitely agree on that one. We improved also the linting support, which basically gives you some kind of highlights where you are doing something which is possibly not that ideal for Chrome OS. So basically, everything what we tell you is beneficial for the phone as well as for, the, for Chrome OS. But in this particular case, it's of course uh, especially for that. Another thing what we were doing is inside the Android, no, inside the Linux VM, we were adding audio support which basically means you are getting all the audio tools which we are used to use on Linux directly on the system, which means Audacity and all these kind of things are working. So and for the next thing, I'm calling to Emily, who is actually demonstrating how to improve, well, how we have actually used ADB now over USB. Thanks, Stefan. So I'm super happy to uh, announce uh, what we've added here. Can we bump over to the computer? So here I have Android Studio running on the Pixelbook. Oops. And I could run. Uh oh, what have I done? Aha, OK. Well, I ran the app and it pushed it directly to the device. This is last year's news if you're here last year, so there's nothing that new with that. But what is new, is, and this does not require developer mode, so it's super exciting. I got Pixel 2 phone, I can plug it in over USB. And this time, actually, let's do a profiling, just so you know that I'm legit here. Um, in the bottom, you see this connect to Linux, so allow Linux to access my USB device. And if the demo gods smile, and they have smiled on me, Google Pixel 2 XL is right there, so I can select the phone. This will hopefully run my profiler. There we go. The app is hopefully working, please. Installing APKs. Oops. My screen has fallen asleep. So there's the app running. You can see the profiling. It's legit. Yeah, you can clap. Yeah, woo! Thank you, Stefan, and your team. And you can see if I clack. You get the screen, you know, you get the screen tabs, you can dig into the memory just like you'd expect in profiling. What can I say? Thanks a lot. I'll be back, don't worry. Back to you, Stefan. Awesome demo. Many thanks, Emily. Okay, so another thing, we know that you are actually one of the power users of our system because you have an IDE, you have Android applications, you have Chrome, all these other kind of things. And one of the things what you're really missing is a virtual desktop. So Beginning with M76, which is currently in, uh, in our Canary channel, you can already test out this feature. Simply go into Chrome's Flex and turn it on. Another thing what we were doing is, well, in the past, HDCP was not really supported on an external monitor. We have mitigated that. You can now play back videos on an external screen. If you ever plan to actually use, for example, Surface View set secure, well, be aware there are monitors which are not supporting this. And it's, of course, a very bad experience for the user if he sees only a black box instead of buttons and cannot press anything. So therefore, don't really use it if you don't really mean to use it. Another thing what we were doing is integration. So a lot of integration work was going, for example, into AR Core, which is in all our tablets which have world-facing cameras. It's being used already in schools for things like GeoGebra and Google Expedition, and many more to follow. Another thing what we were doing is instant app support. Instant app support is ready to roll out. And if your application is doing this, you will actually see that very shortly. I.O. I have seen this somewhere. Uh, well, this is meant to be exactly as meant, input and output. So we have done various things around I.O. One of them is bringing some drives, any kind of external media, to Chromebooks. So, when you plug it in, the Android application will be able to access it directly. So that was one of the big asks from last year. <laughs> Another thing is play files. So this is something which is, if you ever use the Chrome OS 
files browser, you have possibly seen that there was no way of accessing the Android files if you want to send something or inspect something. Well, now inside this tool, you have actually also play files, which is the mirror of SD card. So you can get to all these files. Another thing is, if you have a documents provider API, uh, like, for example, Google Drive, Dropbox, or anything like that, they will actually be reflected now also in the files application. So basically, this is fully transparent, and it's running inside Chrome space, but it's using all the Android features on that point. So you can drag and drop files now from all these cloud storage providers without anything uh, uh, thinking about that. And if you, have, if you are using this cloud provider API for your own applications, you can even then make it that you can actually use this directly, uh, so like editing our files and so on. Managed devices, we had there also several new add-ons. So first off, we were improving the installation speed from minutes to seconds. And it's also much more secure, so therefore it should be now really be installed when uh, an administrator is asking for it. Another thing what we were doing is when you're using the VPN connection from Chrome OS, then Android will automatically use the same VPN connection, which is a huge improvement in regards of security. So and now I'm coming to the most important thing for you, because this is a section which is explicitly trying to target all the things where you should actually watch out for to make your application shine on Chrome OS. So let's have a look. Multi-monitor. This is not really new, right? We were talking about this one already last year. But one of the things what we were silently doing behind the, behind the scenes was we were doing a lot of scaling. Because the thing is, if you have an internal small monitor which has 4K, and you have an external big screen which is maybe even also 4K, then there is an, a size differential of 2 to 1, which basically means if you are dragging a window from A to B, suddenly it becomes like a giant mess. So, and therefore, that is something what the user doesn't really want to see. So, therefore, what we do is we scale that thing down to match the same size as on the, on the notebook. But the problem with that is, of course, that, well, scaling means like you are losing some, some information from the thing. It's getting blurry. It's not really that great. So, and uh, uh, therefore, what we are trying to do going forward is we will actually change the density on the, on the fly. That is something what we were talking about last year and the year before about changing the size. So this is now the next thing, which is the next and the last thing that we are asking anything from you, is uh, to actually make your application be aware of different densities on an activity level. So don't do that into inside your service or whatnot. Do it actually inside the activity, because you might actually have multiple windows on the screen, and you never know where it is, right? So and because of that, if you're using on configuration changes, check out the density, and otherwise listen to these kind of events. So gaming, if you were ever using gaming and you were using a, a game controller, you have possibly noticed that there is not really much of what Android is doing. So you cannot really figure out how many controllers are connected. And if the mapping was wrong, it didn't really work, we are changing this. Basically, very soon you will actually have the standard API, which is on any phone. So if you want to test it out, test it on your phone. If it's working there, it'll work in the, in the future. Well, then there's relative mouse positioning, which is used by all kinds of first-person shooters and whatnot. We have that also now supported, which went out in uh, M74, which is now in file, well, in, in, in release state. So you can request the pointer, and you can actually listen then to all changes and go for that. So and with that, I'm coming to the most important topic of this talk, which is animation junk. Well, if you were ever doing any kind of animations, you have possibly seen kind, some kind of jank. What is jank? It's something like when something moves very slowly, suddenly you see this kind of hiccup, when something is like stuck and then continuing. So and there is unfortunately no tool up till now which shows you where this hiccup is coming from. But we were working on that very hard. So and for that, I have a small presentation for that. So unfortunately, this is not that easy. There are a lot of boxes, but uh, don't be scared. If you have never seen them before, I will actually guide you through everything. So first off, when you look into a standard application, it is usually using double buffering. What does double buffering mean? It means you have one buffer which is being shown and one buffer which is being rendered to. And you are constantly iterating between the two of them. And the application is basically it's getting the buffer, it's rendering to the buffer, and it's submitting the buffer to be displayed. And then it's doing the same thing again, and over and over and over again. It's always exactly the same thing. 
And in screen space, you see then first the old picture, then comes the vSync, which is basically the end of the scan out of the buffer, which means like at which point in time you can flip to the next one, and then it flips to the next frame. This is the ideal state. So looking deeper into the system, there's driver space. So in driver space, we are waiting now for the vSync from the previous frame so that we can take the buffer and render stuff into it. So which is basically then producing all the buffmaster DMA commands and putting them into one contiguous buffer so that the GPU can read them and continuing the same thing. And in GPU space, the GPU is simply like taking that thing, it's executing these buffers which were being produced by the driver space and doing that one by one and flipping it automatically via hardware event into view as soon as it is needed. So where comes Jenk now in play? Well, Jenk comes if, for example, the rendering takes much longer than you expect. So and in that case, what happens? Well, basically, you're repeating the previous frame. And even worse, whatever you have already queued up in order to be rendered is possibly producing the next frame, which is also bad. So it's not only one frame, which is bad. It's two or three. So therefore, it's really a bad thing to have that. So another thing what can happen is that in user space, you will actually see something similar. So which means like, for example, there is memory swapping involved. Chrome is basically loading some new notifications. Or maybe uh, uh, Android is doing some compaction or whatnot. And in that case, you might actually end up in the same state. So but unfortunately, we are running a desktop operating system, right? which is not only that. So now it's getting a little bit more complicated because we have suddenly multiple clients which have to be rendered. So, we have now n things which are being rendering at the same time. So think about everything what I was talking before, but only n times. So in this case, two. And we have in driver space exactly as many boxes again, only doubled. And well, the GPU space gets crammed, right? Because we have to do now multiple things, which are all being serialized. And well, then comes the scary thing, which is a compositor. What is a compositor? Well, basically, it's now taking all these surfaces and it's compositing them together into one surface, which means like we have to read everything again, write it again into the output buffer, which is another overhead, right? So let's complete the picture with some more boxes from what happened before. And now if you look into the screen and you look from the upper left to the lower right, you see that the blue thing is percolating through the system all the way to the output, uh, except for there is no blue slide on the screen, right? which means we have already created a pipeline here. A pipeline is a good thing in some ways, because the thing is like if the system has some fluctuations, like memory swapping or whatnot, you can compensate for them. But the thing is, it has also the problem that if you click something, it might actually take a little bit of time, additional time, to actually see that. So the good news is there is actually very old technology from the 90s, which is actually trying to eliminate this by using overlays. So overlays is basically the GPU is then reading out two buffers at the same time, and it's blending them together. But unfortunately, that works only as long as you're not zooming in or not, you are, you're not turning your display into portrait, for example. Uh, so and since most users are possibly playing around with a zoom level, it might actually not work. The good news, on the other hand, is we are working on it. By the end of the year, I hope much, much earlier, we will be able to address that, and you will have always double buffering if you're running in front. So with that, coming to the tool itself. So what can the tool do? Well, first off, it can actually show how the buffers are per percolating through the system. It can show you when memory was actually being swapped. It can show you how busy the CPU and the GPU is at any point in time. It can actually show you all kinds of things, temperature, speed, and whatnot from all the different components inside the system. And Best of all, if you have some traces inside your code and you want to see exactly what happened at what point in time, you can actually put them in there and you can actually see them and monitor them there as well so that you see everything in relation to each other. And then you can actually drill down and see why you have seen junk. So with that, let's come to a sort of demo. So let's see. Let's bring up our tool. So this tool is basically it's a small particle generator. And you can see already here, oh, let me close this guy here. Uh, you can, so you can basically see like the lower line is 60 frames per second, the next line is 30 frames per second, 15, and so on and so on. So, and um, um, so in order to start the tool, what I'm doing is I'm pressing Control Shift G. So now tool is running, and there was already Jenk. Look at that. That was fast, much faster than expected. So let's see. So first, let's try to zoom out a little bit to see the regular pattern. You can actually see now here, I hope you can see my cursor. Yes, you can. Awesome. 
you can actually see how the buffer is. So first off, we have four buffers here. So the upper line is always in the, the thing what the application and or surface flinger sees. The next line is what Chrome is seeing for its compositor. And then comes the next buffer, and the next buffer, and the next buffer. So there are lots of buffers. We have four buffers, means quadruple buffering. So then we have the Android compositor, which is doing a little bit of stuff before it's actually passing it on to Chrome. And it's doing something. And we see Chrome is also rendering. And as you can see, there are two buffers, which is basically saying it's to using double buffering at that point in time. And looking into the memories, memory thing, you can actually see how much memory was being used. You can see a line creeping up here, which is, oh, well, look at that. So memory is actually definitely creeping up over time. And you can also then see that the GPU was very busy here. See, so there is only a little bit. And there here is a pretty solid line. So let's drill in and let's see. The GL thread was taking longer. Look at that. OK, so why was the GL thread keep taking more time? Let's have a look. Uh, there is, what is this? I think this is, the temperature of the system is incredible. It's 84 degrees. That is possibly already the reason why it was actually going down, because you we are starting possibly to throttle the system at that point in time. So, but in general, this tool gives you all the information in one go, and you can, let's scroll through, you can see at the end that there is composition jank somewhere. So if you want to see anything more about this tool, please come by our sandboxes. We have there actually people which we were training to actually, and or they are even working on the tool, which, is, uh, which are able to actually handle anything inside your application if you want to see why your application is janking. Please let us know. So with that, back to the slides. So if you want to try it out on your own, M75 is going to beta around today or tomorrow. So you can actually simply take the beta channel, go into developer mode. Unfortunately, you need developer mode for this because traces are, of course, some kind of security risk. So therefore, we, you need to be in developer mode for that one. So and then uh, go into settings, flags, and uh, say that you want to use uh, the visualization tool. And then uh, go navigate to this page to see the result. Um, for the usage, stop on Jenk, activate that, add your additional counters if you want to, and run your application. And then once you are at the point, press Control Shift G and see what happens. You can use W and S at any point in time in order to zoom in and out of the timeline. Last but not least, we have updated our documentation. So if you go online, you will actually see that uh, how to use the tool. And we will add more information there going forwards. And uh, well, come to our sandbox to actually get it done. With that, I'm passing it on to Emily. Thanks, Stefan. So I'm Emily Roberts. I'm a developer advocate working on uh, Chrome OS. I know many of you, which is really exciting. And okie dokie. So we've learned a lot about where Chrome OS is and lots of the new tools and features we've brought this year. I want to talk a little bit about what you can do to optimize your app what you can do to make your apps look awesome and work really awesome on Chrome OS. So I'm going to talk a little bit about input and then about output. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the, the slash in the middle, which is a surprise topic uh, coming up. So your applications should support keyboard. Thanks very much. Have a good day. <laughs> Just kidding. If you know me, I like to talk a lot. So I'm going to talk about a few more things. Seriously, support keyboard input. I know most people here already do that. And if you do, the code looks something like this. So if I'm looking for a key up or key down, I'm looking for the J key. I do what I want to do. I return true. Everything's good. One little gotcha that we've seen in a few apps, don't swallow every key that the system sends. So if I'm not using a key, so I'm not using any other key but J here, pass it back up to super, back up to the system. For example, Chrome OS might want to do something smart with Control N and open a new window, or Control Shift G, like that tool we just saw, and run the graphics trace. If your app is a black hole that swallows all the key presses, then it's sad for the user, or else Chrome OS has to do some tricks. So pass it up to Super. Some of you may have noticed that Chrome OS keyboards have a refresh key. What the heck is up with that? It's a legitimate key. It's got his very own key code and everything, key code refresh. 
So in the web world, it makes sense to refresh a web page. But if you think about social media apps or any content app, there's also a refresh type of action that users expect. And if there's a refresh key sitting in front of your users, well, they're going to expect when they press it that your app refreshes. So you just need to handle key code refresh like in the previous slide and do the refresh action in your app. The good news is if you're already using swipe refresh layout, this will be wired up. I don't think it's quite wired up yet, but it'll be wired up automatically for you um, coming forward. So you press refresh. That type of layout will refresh automatically. Oh, this one's fun. So if you think about a mobile operating system and an app optimized for that, and suddenly it's on a laptop with a touchpad and stylus and all that stuff, it's a super interesting, wonderful, super challenging problem to think about. Like, how does that happen? Um, it's cool. That's why I'm doing the job I'm doing. It's super interesting. So let's talk about touchpad, for example. A user on a desktop, if they do a two-finger swipe with a touchpad, they expect the app to scroll. Well, that's not what happens in a phone, where it's like a one-finger hold and drag type of motion. So Chrome OS automatically wires that up for you. So most of you have nothing to do. A user swipes on the touchpad, and it works. That's awesome. That's what we want. If you're doing something a little more um, tricky with your motion events, for example, if you're a drawing app, maybe that scrolling motion is going to start drawing on the canvas, which is not what you want. So all you have to do is, or what works in most cases, I should say, check the button state. If it's 0, no buttons being pressed. It's not a drawing event, and you can just ignore it. And that should work great. Okie dokie. So this is a super fun game. It's uh, EA's NBA Live Mobile Basketball. Take a look at it. Um, it's pretty fun to play on Chromebooks. It's a little janky on the screen, but that's OK. So take a look at the left and take a look at the right. EA did something really smart, which is if a system is not keeping up, then it's cutting out extra animations and that stuff so that the actual gameplay is still going on, which is awesome. Um, but you'll notice. <laughs> That poor guy on the left, his basketball's trilling along behind him like a little chihuahua. Um, he's not really doing anything cool. This is so left is the past, and the right frame is the current state of things. It's much more interesting. The ball's bouncing up and down. He's doing these, like cool moves. That's what we want to see. So the issue was absolutely not EAs. This game is awesome. In fact, as I said, I think they did something really intelligent. Um, the issue was Chrome OS. Our language skills weren't that good. We don't speak ARM that well for many of our x86 devices. And so the good news is we've gone to language school. We've diligently done our homework. We speak ARM a little bit better. So our translation from ARM to x86 is much better. So games will automatically um, get that. And uh, there's a lot of new improvements coming this year in the pipeline already. So if you're building for ARM, good news. Should see some improvements in translation. You'll be able to do those, those cool moves. However, if you care about performance, and who doesn't, right? Uh, but especially if you're a game or a creative app, support x86. Because all of our top applications are, sorry, our top devices are x86. Most of them are 64 bit. The 64 bit requirement's coming. Um, and don't throw away ARM32, because obviously there's lots of those devices too. So ARM32, ARM64, x86 32, x86 64. Sounds like a lot, but it's actually quite easy in Android Studio. And um, with Android App Bundles, it bundles it up all nicely, sends it to the Play Store. The Play Store will only send the ABIs that your users need, so it doesn't increase their download size or anything like that. So thank you very much in advance for always supporting x86. Okie dokie. So here's a to topic I'm really excited about, which is layout. This is the O. Oh, I didn't tell you. The slash was the NDK translation. So input slash NDK. Oh, anyway. So let's talk about layout. There are mobile phones, obviously, but we're moving a lot beyond that. There's tablets. There's Chromebooks. There's foldables. There's external monitors. There's TVs. There's all sorts of things. Your apps need to work across all of those devices. And that's becoming more and more true as time goes on. And the ideal situation is one app can just fluidly and seamlessly handle that. So on a Chromebook, if I'm resizing, your app just gets bigger. It looks great. does what it needs to do. Somebody opens a foldable. It works great. Somebody plugs in an external monitor. It works great. So 
This goes a long way. Um, one approach is to use different layout buckets based on screen sizes. So I'm sure many of you have seen this. I hope so. If not, you can check out our resizing code lab in the code lab tents. You have one resource file and then different layout buckets, landscape, wide landscape, wide portrait. Maybe you have six, maybe you have two, depending on your layout. Let's talk about something else, which is uh, navigation patterns. So this is how your users experience your app, how they get around your app, how they explore your content. Um, super related to screen sizes, but I think it deserves its own separate topic. So what happens if you have a mobile phone app and you put it on an external monitor? It might look something like this. It looks horrible. It looks terrible. This is a photo viewing app. And the developer, the designer, should probably be sent back to design school, should be thrown out of the building. It's me, so don't throw me out yet, please. Give me a, give me a second chance. But you can see that it's a photo viewing app. Maybe on a phone, fine. You have 100 photos. You don't want a million little previews. But come on. We've got lots of screen real estate. We can do better. I could literally like, fit inside those columns with my arms outstretched. There's so much wasted space. And most importantly, take a look at the navigation. It's all stretched out. It's tiny. Can you see what, it's at, what those icons are? I doubt it from there. Right. And if you're um, visually, you know, if you have some different, you're a lower vision user, you're a little bit farsighted, you're a normal person um, with perfect eagle eye vision, it's really hard to see, to understand, and if you have any mobility issues, to even interact with those touch targets. Thumbs down, right? So I, I get a second chance. Uh, here's my second draft. You can see I did a little bit better. It's a photo viewer. I put a little photo preview if I have enough space. Did a little bit better in the middle. And most importantly, this is what I'm talking about. The navigation is over on the left. Um, this is a side navigation. It's got icons, labels. They're all close together. It's easy to navigate for anybody using the navigation. Um, that GitHub link will be live very soon. If you want to see my amazing code for this amazing demo, uh, check it out probably later this week or next week. And take a look at the material design site. There's lots of great things. They have a number of material studies, which are like toy apps looking at the stuff. And they're doing exactly what I'm talking about. So they're on a mobile phone. Maybe they use the bottom navigation. If it's a large landscape. They've got side navigation with icons and labels. And then if it's large but not so large, maybe like a rail navigation on the left. I want to take just a second to call out a really awesome developer we've worked with this year. Adobe, um, as they were optimizing Adobe Acrobat for Chrome OS this year, which meant keyboard input, mouse input, drag and drop, all that other great stuff, they also redesigned their layout so it worked really well on large screens. So a mobile phone, they've got exactly the same bottom navigation, which makes sense. People are used to, works. But on a larger screen, moves to the side navigation. So great work, Adobe. Thank you. And I'm sure your users thank you, too. You can check out Adobe. Um, Acrobat and some of their other apps in our sandbox tent, um, or for yourself. OK, so this is the slide I inserted um, as a gift to you. In case you haven't dived into Jetpack yet, please do. As an Android developer, it's made my life so much easier. Thank you very much. Um, particularly with what we're talking about, particularly uh, all these different screen sizes, view model just makes saving your state so much easier. It's a very elegant way to handle it. And navigation makes your fragment headaches, and your pushing and popping to the fragment stack go away. So d.android.com slash jetpack. Check it out. I think you'll appreciate it if you don't know what I'm talking about. So we're nearing the end. Uh, I wanted to do our call out to our code labs. We have uh, resizing code lab as well as uh, optimizing code lab, which is like keyboard, mouse, drag and drop, all that fun stuff. They've been slightly refreshed for 2019, so check them out. And what's cool in the Code Lab tent is you can go onto a Chromebook, develop on the Chromebook in Android Studio, like we saw earlier, and then push it right to the device, which is kind of cool as well. Last but not least, we have a bunch of sandboxes all around I.O. Um, so in the Chrome OS tent, in the gaming tent, in the Android tent. We're in Flutter, I think. Anyway, we're all over. And uh, you can talk with the engineers that are building these products. We were really fortunate to get like 40 of the engineers that work on Chrome OS. So if you have questions, go and talk to them. Use them. Try this stuff out. Try lots of the great apps we have. And uh, Linux, also known as Crustini on Chromebooks, is uh, really improving. So you can go into uh, the Chrome OS 10 and look at developing 
on Chromebooks for the web, for Android, game development. We got Unity running, which is kind of cool. And most importantly, well, not most importantly, least importantly, check out our cool enamel pins. We have uh, eight of them. The eighth one, I think, is super secret, but we have seven that you can go in each of the sandboxes. They're really cool. Collect them. And with that, I think I've got no more slides left. Oh, yeah, sorry. There's my little pin. That's from the Android Sandbox. Check it out. Okie dokie. So you've learned a lot about what's going on. I hope you're excited about the new tools, and I hope you're excited about the enamel pins. Please think about screen sizes. Please think about navigation and keyboard input. Support x86. And all these things can help us support you on the Play Store. Keep in touch. Let us know what you're doing. We're really excited, um, as always, to work with the developers and this great community. So thank you for building on Chrome OS. Thank you for building for Chrome OS. And thanks for your time for coming here today and spending it with us and interacting with us after. We'll be around in the sandboxes. And with that, I've got to say thank you to Sweet and Stefan, my fellow co-presenters. And thanks again to you. Talk to you soon. Thank you.